All right, well, good evening, everybody. I'm Pastor Michael Fillmore. This is His Grace Church, man, a destination for divine visitation, man, where we're touching lives and we're changing hearts tonight. And so, glory to God. Amen? Amen. We're going to continue in our series tonight on our Back to the Basics on health and healing, man. Sometimes I think it's important that we go back to what I consider the basics, the very things that, that I learned when I first became a believer that set the course of my life, that assisted me and helped me to become, and not to become, but to develop in the core values uh, of my, my belief system, and then also learn what Jesus appropriated for me through Calvary. And so, in this segment of lessons, um, we're going to review what really happened at the cross through God's redemptive work that was accomplished through Jesus Christ. And we're going to start this segment th this evening by looking at when did sickness and sin enter humanity in the human race? You know, we say that, that Jesus redeemed us from sickness and disease. So that means that if he bought us back, he ransomed us out of, he paid the price to return us to an unfallen state. When did sickness and disease then enter into, the, into humanity or even the human race? And one of the big questions that has to be settled in our minds and hearts is this. When Jesus died on the cross, did his death, burial, and resurrection provide healing for our bodies or just forgiveness of sins? Was it a complete package or did he just do one and not the other? <clears throat> now, most believers will emphatically uh, agree that forgiveness of sins was provided through our redemption, through the cross. That's why Jesus came. He came to provide the redemption uh, of our sins or to buy back or to ransom us out of what Adam did through the fall <clears throat> And he came to forgive and deliver us from our sin and sinful life. But we know that Jesus died for our sins. But the question that we must settle is, when Jesus died for our sins, did that include sickness and disease too? When Jesus took care of sin, did he take care of sickness as well? So... When did sickness and disease enter into the human race? Well, you know, I think we have to look at the subject of sin first to see what damage was wrought when sin entered into the world. And we know that Jesus put away sin on the cross, right? So if we can establish what sin brought with it, then we can prove that Jesus put it all the way at Calvary. Because if he took care of sin, he took care of everything that sin brought with it when it was introduced into the world. So let's again begin by looking at the word of God tonight. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 tells us, When Adam sinned, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So, how did sin enter into the world? The Bible says that sin came through Adam. But what was the result of that sin? What was the result of sin? Again, we see through Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone and everyone sinned. So Adam's sin brought death. Who did, who did this death pass to? It says right here, to everyone. It passed to everyone. So let me ask you a question tonight. Would everyone include us? Yes. Right? That's, we're included in the everyone. Everyone but you. No, we are included in the everyone. So because it includes us, let's, for a few moments, let's discuss that fateful word, death. 
Now, as we already mentioned through our previous studies, there are three types of death we've looked at, right? We've looked at the spiritual death, the physical death, and then what we consider the second death. So sin then brought all types of death into the world. It brought spiritual death, physical death, and the second death. And again, spiritual death is what? Is a separation from God. So when we talk about the second death, we're talking about being eternally separated from God. Physical death then causes our bodies to quit functioning. <laughs> That's really what happens. They just quit one day. They wear out and quit function. At which time, then, our spirits leave our bodies. And as believers, then we are present with the Lord. If we are not believers, we are separated from God for eternity. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8 tells us, so we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. It was never God's original plan that our physical bodies die. We were, we were not created for death. We were created for life. If Adam had not sinned, his body would never have died. So, with that said, th th this leads us back to our original question. Where did sickness and disease come from? Because we just saw that without sin, Adam would have lived forever. So, we know sin brought death from our reading in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And then because of that, we can conclude that sin brought sickness and for this reason. Again, sickness or disease is nothing more than a pre-death condition. If a person gets enough sickness or disease in his or her body, it will lead to death. I know this for a fact. Not that I'm dead, but I've had relatives that, that have one, gone on to be with the Lord that had enough sickness in their body that their body could no longer function in normal parameters and eventually it just shut itself down. So, sickness or disease we could say it like this, is a form of death in early stages. And as mentioned earlier, in addition, we know sin brought death, and we can conclude then that sin also brought, brought, brought poverty, another pre-death condition, right? Because if people are starved long enough for food, water, and shelter, it will also lead to death. So, if Jesus conquered sin and put it away, we can be assured that he put away everything that came with sin, meaning that he put away death, sickness, and poverty. Well, wait a minute. You mean I'm, I'm going to live forever? Well, physically, no, because there is a, ter a term limit on our physical bodies. But spiritually, we're going to live. The real you, I like to say it like this. We are a spirit that lives in a body. My body is a, an earth suit that houses my eternal being. And so I am a spirit that lives in a body. And eventually this body is going to decay to the place where it's no longer going to cease to function in the temporal realm and it's going to quit working. The moment that it quits functioning, then the person, the real me, the eternal me that is housed inside this body 
is going to be jettisoned, if you will, from this body. And because I'm, I'm, I'm a believer, I'm going to go and be in the presence of the Lord. How long will I be in the presence of the Lord? Eternally. Man was created as an eternal being. He was created in the image and the likeness of God. God is an eternal being. Man is an eternal being. The, the, the important factor is we ha God gave us a free choice, a free will to decide where we want to spend eternity. We can either spend eternity in the presence of our God or we can spend eternity separated. The decision is ours. And so Jesus redeemed us from death, sickness, and poverty at Calvary. So that's a pretty, pretty strong point. Let's, let's prove this by tonight by looking in the Word of God. Now, what does it mean to be redeemed? Well, one, one avenue of redeemed is that, that um, he ransomed us. He paid a price for us. Sometimes when we go to the animal adoption center, we redeem an animal from the, 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 the adoption center, right? We could say it like this. If they're there long enough, death is going to occur to them. They're going to be euthanized because nobody wants them. So we're ransoming them out of that death. We're redeeming them and bringing them into a new life, which is within our home, a loving life where we care for them, we, we admonish them, we love on them, right? That's exactly what Jesus did when he redeemed us. He brought us out from a place that would cause death to a place and gave us life. And that life that he can nurture us, he can love on us, he can take care of us. And in Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 and 2 it says this. It says, who has believed our message and to whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? Verse 2 says, My servant grew up in the Lord's presence, like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. And there was nothing more beautiful, there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, and nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest of grief. We turned our backs from him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment from his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And all of us like sheep strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He only laid the sins of a few. No, he laid the sins of everyone on Jesus. He was oppressed and treated harsh, harshly, yet he never said a word. He was a, like a lamb led to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants and that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong, and he had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering, yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of this, because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for, the, for he will bear all their sins. And I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death and he is accounted among the rebels. Now, this particular passage of scripture is what I consider the great redemption chapter because it's, it's rich in revelation concerning our redemption. So let's take a few moments and, and just kind of look at it in a little more detail because, and as we do, we're going to see in verse 4 uh, what Christ, what he bore on the cross for us. And so 
according to verse 4, he bore what? He bore our weaknesses. He carried our sorrows. One of the things that I like about this, well, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So let's look at, uh, at the Hebrew word for weakness, griefs, sorrows. And unfortunately, these have not been translated as clearly as they should have been. The Hebrew word for grief is translated disease, grief, and sicknesses in other places in the Bible. When we look at this um, word, we can, see it be, we can see the Hebrew word, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Hebrew word, trust me. But we can see this particular word being translated in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 15, and the Lord will protect you from all sickness. It's the same Hebrew word that griefs. He was despised and rejected a man of sorrows and acquainted with the deepest grief. So, this word grief again is translated here into sickness, and the Lord will protect you from all sickness. He will not let you suffer from the terrible diseases you knew in Egypt but he will inflict them on all your enemies. Now Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 61 goes on to tell us that the Lord will afflict you with every sickness. Again, it's the same word that, the same Hebrew word for the, for the griefs that we see in uh, uh, verse four of Hebrews chapter 53. Said so the Lord will afflict you with every sickness and plague. There is, even those not mentioned in the book of instruction, until you are destroyed. First King seventeen seventeen says, some time later the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse and finally died. Again, it's the Hebrew word that we use for grief. He was rejected, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with the deepest grief. Second Kings chapter 13 and 14. When Elisha was in his last illness, King Je Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteer charioteers of Israel, he cried. You see, Hebrew scholars agree Greece weaknesses Weaknesses. Weaknesses should have been translated here in Isaiah 53 to uh, the word sickness. Trans it should have been translated in sickness. Now, in verse 4, it yet, yet it was for our weakness he carried. It was for our sorrows. That word sorrows, again, could be translated as grief. Uh, in one translation, I like it, it is translated as uh, <clears throat> sicknesses, disease, griefs. Jesus carried our sicknesses and diseases. It weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. So, when we look at this word sorrows as well, it can also be translated as griefs and pains. So we can see that he carried our sicknesses, our diseases, and our pains. Our pains. Too often, when we're in pain, we run to Dr. Tylenol and not Dr. Jesus. We do not give the word time to activate in our heart. Now I believe in Dr. Tylenol because I participate many times with him. But there are times I think that when pain arrives we should number one apply the blood of Jesus, hold it up because Romans, or Romans, Revelations 12 verse 11 says we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. My testimony is I'm holding up the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of Jesus over this pain and I'm healed because of the stripes of Jesus. And if we would begin to activate our faith and we begin to walk in it, we would begin to see the results. It's too easy 
to take other measures, and I'm not against the other measures, so I'm not preaching against something that God, I believe, has provided. But I also believe that we need to activate our faith and trust God and believe God and grow in faith so that when we speak to the mountain of that headache or we speak to the mountain of that pain, we have the responsibility, we see our faith and manifestation through action. So I see both sides of it, and I'm not, and I'm, and I'm not saying don't take pain medication. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying as we are taking it, let's build our faith to receive the promise that God has given us that he has already taken all of our pains. And then begin to walk in that promise. And if, if the Tylenol or the pain medication help you facilitate the growing of your faith until you can receive the promise without it, you know, many times, many times when I'm walking through things, the doctor put me on medication. I don't do well on medication. It's just my physiological makeup doesn't accept medication very well. And so what I, what I would many times do is, is once I have the diagnosis or the understanding of what's wrong, I will begin to take the medication, but I will begin to apply the Word of God to that arena uh, and build my faith until one day I don't have to take the medication anymore. But listen, that one day may be a year. That one day may be a couple years. That one day may require you doing other things to actively pursue the complete restoration of your body. So, you know, uh, sometimes maybe diet and exercise are involved. Uh, maybe whatever. But it's just facilitating the outcome that you want through the Word of God. And the primary thing that must be done is we, we must renew our mind. We must wash our brain, per se, with the Word of God. We, we, you just got to take your brain out of your head, throw it in the washing machine with the, with the detergent called the Word of God. When it's washed and cleansed, I don't know about you, but when I, I do my laundry, like I just, I just did my laundry, it's been a couple months, but I just did my laundry. And now, now Downey has this stuff, you kind of, like these little balls you put in the bottom of it, next to your Tide, your lunch, your Tide um, pod, right? And man, it just makes the laundry, <sighs> it cleanses it. But you see, there's a process to washing my clothes. If I, don't, if I don't act on going into my closet and getting my clothes out of the dirty clothes hamper and put them in the washing machine, they won't, they're just not going to do it themselves. Now, if I don't add the proper amount of cleaning assistance, the detergent, the smell good, which is what they, what do you call that stuff, the, scent. Scent. yeah, the scent, but uh, the fabric softener, that's what it is, the fabric softener, and I have to, I, I mean, I do one load, <laughs> so everything goes in one load, whites, darks, everything, and so then I put in the color bleach to make sure that whole one load, but you see, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do with that laundry load, I can run the water and they ain't gonna come out any cleaner. So you have to use the prescribed method that God has given us to renew our mind, and that is by, uh, by reading the Word, by meditating on the Word, by applying the Word, by studying the Word, and washing our mind with the Word. What does that do? It takes our thoughts, and kind of pushes them aside and bring God's thoughts on the matter to the forefront. So, again, the Hebrew word for sorrows uh, is translated here, pains, griefs, sicknesses, disease, and it's also translated in other places in the Bible. For example, this word, um, it's makabah, it's the Hebrew word, is the best you're going to get out of me tonight. In, in Job chapter 3, 33, verse 19, it says that God disciplines people with pain on their sick beds with ceaseless achings in their bones. Now, our God doesn't discipline us that way. Judgment comes, we open ourselves up, 
But God is not the author of sickness and disease. He cannot put sickness and disease on you because it's not his nature and is not in his wheelhouse. Sickness and disease comes from the enemy. Jesus said in John chapter 10 verse 10, the thief comes to what? Rob, kill, and to destroy. But I've come to give life and life more abundantly. So whatever is robbing, killing, destroying, stealing is not coming from God. That's why when people say, oh, this was an act of God. This tornado went through, destroyed everything. That was just an act of God. Yeah, it was an act of God, but it wasn't the God that I serve because God is love. And love does not destroy and perfect love cast out all fear. But there is a God of this world, according to Corinthians. His name is Satan. Satan is a destroyer. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. He's come to destroy, to steal, to kill. And so... When we look at Job, people think, well, look what God did to Job. No, he, he, what, what God did to Job is he took away the hedge of protection that was around him and allowed the devil to have access to him. There's a hedge of protection around you called the blood of Jesus. Learn to identify it and learn to use it as a protection. In Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 18, Babylon has suddenly fallen and be, been destroyed. Wail for her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. So again, we see this word uh, pain. This comes from the Hebrew word makabah, and it's translated in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 as a grief, sorrow. And so we could read Isaiah 53 and verse 4 like this. In this way, surely he hath borne our sickness and carried our pains. Who? Jesus, the master. Jesus took this at Calvary. He carried our sicknesses, he, he bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. Now, according to Young's literal translation, this scripture reads, surely our sicknesses he hath borne and our pains he carried them. Well, wait a minute. If he carried them, why do I got them? Because we haven't learned to get rid of them. We have been programmed that is part of life. And because we've been programmed, we've learned to accept these things instead of deny them. Because if Jesus took them and carried them for us, whose are they? How many times when you have a pain, you say, oh, my back. Whoa, this pain in my back. We're identifying it as ours. We're identifying this pain or this sickness. We're making it ours. My diabetes right? My heart. When Jesus took it, it's no longer mine. I don't have to receive it. Though the symptoms may exist in my body for a certain time frame, I have the right to reject them. I have the right to stand up and declare, as it says in, Roman, or in, in Revelations 12 verse 11, I've overcome by the blood of the Lamb. I hold the blood of Jesus up as a testament that I am healed because it was his, through his blood, the shedding of his blood, there could have been no, without the shedding of the, of the blood, there's no remission of sins. So through the shedding of his blood, there's forgiveness of sins. That means because everything that, that is encompassed in sin, death, sickness and disease and poverty, he's taken them. They're not mine anymore. I don't have legal ownership of them unless I want it. He owns my sickness. He took it. He took it. He took it from me. But have you ever tried to wrestle something away from somebody who didn't want to give it up? Come get my blanket at night. I mean, Pastor Kim has tried to wrestle that. Well, when we were younger, she would try to, she did wrestle it from me. And I would take it back. Eventually, we got our own blankets. But think about it. 
If you don't want to give it up, no matter how much somebody wants it, they're not going to get it. So you've got to be willing to release it and reject it. I don't want that sickness. Sometimes sickness and disease comes and we like having it so people will feel sorry for us. Now we say that we won't say that as true, but all of us like sympathy, don't we? Oh, you poor thing. What can I do for you? You can get me something to eat. Right? We all like to have, to, to feel that, you know, that people love and care for us. And sometimes through thick, sickness and disease, it draws out the strengths of other people to come help us. And so it makes us feel good. Now, if we go around rejecting that, then we have to understand that maybe we won't get the sympathy that we would want to have at that point in time. So, again, Young's literal translation of the scripture reads this way, Surely our sicknesses he hath borne, or carried, or taken, and our pains he carried them. Our pains. Dr. Isaac Leeser's translation of the Hebrew Bible, which is a translation authorized for use by Orthodox Jews, reads it this way. Our diseases did he bear himself. Our pains he carried. And while we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. So he did bear himself our pains and our diseases. Now, we see this truth in numerous other translations as well. So let's look at... Let's, let's look at verse 4, Isaiah 53 and verse 4, in the Berkeley version, where it says, Surely he hath borne our sicknesses. He carried, and as for our pains, he bare their burdens of them. The Rotherham says this, Surely our sickness he carried. Oh, I was on the wrong... So the Berkeley version says, surely has borne our sicknesses. The Rotherham says, surely our sicknesses he carried. As for our pains, he bare the burden of them. And the Masoretic text, surely our diseases he did bear and our pains he carried. Our diseases he did bear and our pains he carried. Matthew chapter 8 verses 16 and 17 goes on to tell us that evening many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command and he healed all the sick. Now if sickness and disease originates in heaven, if sickness and disease comes from God and God's bringing sickness and disease on people, Why would Jesus heal us? Because God's trying to teach them a lesson. They need to stay sick. But Jesus healed all the sick. But I think it's also interesting how as he's healing the sick, he's casting out evil spirits as well. And verse 17 goes on and tells, This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah who said he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. It points back to Isaiah 53, verse 4, and this is where Jesus was quoting. And he made the meaning of this passage very clear, didn't he? He not only spoke it, but he did it and proved it. Now, if we look at verse 16, it says that he cast out, in Matthew chapter 8, he cast out the evil spirits with a simple command and he healed all the sick. So how did Jesus then quote Isaiah 53 and verse 4? He says, this fulfilled. Isaiah is pointing forward to a time that was to come. Jesus is now pointing forward past tense. He said, this fulfilled the word of the Lord to the prophet Isaiah. What you're seeing, what you're hearing, fulfills what Isaiah the prophet spoke. 
So, can there be any question tonight that Jesus took our sicknesses and pains when he went to the cross? Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, rereading this particular passage of scripture, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, he was beaten so we could be whole, and he was whipped so we could be healed. Let me read this from another translation. I'm going to read it from the New King James as well. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. doesn't say we are going to be healed. It's not future tense. It's a statement of fact that by his stripes we are the healed. We are the healed. So, let's take a moment and review this verse. In it, we will clearly see that our redemption, again, is threefold. So, we've been redeemed, right? We've been redeemed spirit, soul, and body. When Jesus was wounded and bruised for our transgressions and iniquities, our spirit was redeemed. Without Jesus, we were not destined, we were destined to be eternally separated from the Father. Our spirit was unrenewed. Our spirit was dead to God. When we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, which is the greatest gift, the Bible says that our inner man, that we are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the, into the kingdom of his dear son. What happens in that moment of time, that inner man who was dead unto God is removed and a new man is put in on the inside of you. Sounds really freaky and strange, but that's exactly what happens. You are not per se, uh, regenerated or reborn, there's a new person living on the inside of you. That which has been dead, on, that which is part of the kingdom of, of, of the devil, that what we were born into sin has been removed, and a new person who is alive and created unto God has been put on the inside. He redeemed you. He ransomed you out. He paid that price for your spirit so that you could be new. All things become new when we accept Jesus Christ. So, then it goes on to say, when, when Jesus was chastised for our peace, when we look at this, he's talking about our soul, which is our mind, our emotions, and our will. Now, is it interesting that he talks about our will? Our will is our, our choice, our choosing. Well, we made a decision to accept Jesus, so he redeemed us in our spirit. But now, he's redeeming our mind, our emotions, and our will. We have now choices. And those choices are choices for God or against God. We make those choices. But then it also helps us to see how Jesus redeemed us when we talk about, all right, when we talk about physical sickness, which we're going to look at in just a moment. Well, let's, let's read this. When Jesus receives stripes in his body, our physical bodies were redeemed. They were ransomed out. They were bought out. They were paid for. So our physical bodies, to live in health was part of the covenant that Jesus paid through the redemptive process of the cross. Sickness and disease doesn't have authority over us unless we give it authority over us. But if we do not renew our mind and understand, I was telling Pastor Kim today, it's just something been going around on the inside of me. I heard Brother Hagen say this many years ago, and it, it just is, it's just been kind of rolling around on the inside of me, and I can't give you the exact quote, so I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, if the, if the church would get an understanding of the authority that they really do have through the work of Jesus, every devil in hell would tremble in fear. In other words, nothing would be impossible to you because you'd understand the biblical concept of what Jesus has given you. 
Number one, it begins with authority of who you are in Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that, that, that I'm going to read it to you. You've been made to be seated with him in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but that which is also to come. You've been made to be seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ, far above every work of the enemy. There's a position of authority that you have been placed in. Jesus is seated where? The Bible says that he's seated at the right hand of God. It's a, when, when we talk about seated, number one, we talk about a finished work. When we talk about the right hand of God, we talk about authority. He's seated in power and authority at the right hand of God because the work that he came to do is finished. In other words, there's nothing more he can do for you because he's already completed everything that there was to complete so you could have the best life possible. Now, what happens is we don't see ourselves seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are we seated? Far above. When it says, with Christ Jesus, we are seated with him now we may be living in the earth, but spiritually we are seated with him. Where's God? Where's he seated? At the right hand of God, which is a position of power and authority far above all principality, power and might. Do you think when the devil begins to roar and thunder, Jesus goes, oh my goodness, what are we going to do now, Father? When he was on the earth, what did he do? He commanded those devils to shut up, to deceive their maneuvers, to quit, and to leave these people alone. Why? Because he knew the authority that was invested in him. We have been given that same authority in the name of Jesus Christ. That name of Jesus, the Bible says, is above every name, that at the name of Jesus of things in heaven, things in earth, and things beneath the earth, every devil in hell must bow its knee to that name. When you understand the authority that you walk in, then things begin to happen. But you will never understand the authority unless you begin to renew your mind by the Word of God. Because it's within that Word that authority comes from. It's not your Word, it's His Word. And if you don't know His Word, then you'll never walk in the authority and the power of His Word. And, you know, the seven sons of Sceva said, you know, they tried to cast out the devil out of this man. And they said, you know, it, by, the, by the, what was it, by the name of, of Jesus or by the name of Paul, we adjure you. I, I don't exactly what name they used. They said, Paul we know, Jesus we know, but who are you? They knew but did not know the authority that was invested in them. And had they had known it, they would have said, come out in the name of Jesus. And those demons of hell would have had to obey. Those demons of hell may try to fight back and they try to may rock the boat. But in the end, the devil knows where he's going. He knows his time is coming to an end. He knows things are almost wrapping up and finishing. But he knows that if he can lie to you to believe something that's not the truth, Truth, then he's got you. That's why he says, Paul says, beware, be watchful, be mindful, be vigilant for the, your devil. For the devil is, is ro going around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So Jesus, so when, we, when Jesus was chastised for our peace, that tells me that our mind and emotions, he took care of that problem. For those of you that are, that are dealing with emotional baggage, you have maybe um, psychological, uh, psychiatric problems. Jesus already took it that. You know, one thing that I, I have a grave dislike for, and I, and I, and I just saw a, a post from a, a, a dear friend of mine. He said, all these people that deal with anxiety and a pop and pills, he said, they just need to come to the altar and let me cast the devil out of them. Well, Jesus already provided something for us. He took care of it, the chastisement of our peace. The Bible says in, in, in Philippians chapter 4, don't be anxious, don't be stressed out, don't be worried for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God, so that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will come upon you and encompass your heart. Sometimes we just need to know that we are the healed. You know, 
Emotional baggage comes in all different areas. Psych psychiatric baggage. But what, what, what happens so many times is that people have physical symptoms and we bow and cow and, you know, and I'll give an example and, and I'll use my own life. Several years ago, as you remember, people thought I had a heart attack. So I was in, I was in the ICU for five days. And while I was in the ICU, there was just an outpouring of love and people. And man, listen, I appreciated everybody who came to the hospital. There were ministers and friends. They were just, you know, there for Kim because it was a trying time for me. And so over a process of time, I, 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 I applied the word of God and walked free of that. But when I was diagnosed with complex post traumatic stress syndrome and all the things that came with it, you know, there's a whole bunch of different support. Pull up your bootstraps. Get your life together. Well, you know, that comes from years of living with trauma and learning how to live a different lifestyle. And you have to, you have to redefine uh, the, not the thought processes, but you know, those are learned behaviors that have to be unlearned. So somebody says, I'm going to cast that out of you. Well, how do they cast out learned behaviors? But God will lead you to a place where there's complete redemption. We have the blood of Jesus. Just because that happened to me. You know, let me say this. Forgiveness is a powerful tool. No matter what has happened in your life and who has hurt you. Deep on the inside of me, I, 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 I'm almost hesitant. Well, deep on the inside of me for a long time, there was just, I, I, when we ask God to help us and he'll help us, God will begin to show us. And it may take you some time to get to a place where that healing can, can transpire. And so as I was walking through this journey, I, I began to get the scratchiness. I, I, I would have nightmares and wake up and all these things. And, and I would tell Pastor Kim, it's like there's, there's, there's emotional baggage there that needs to be addressed. It, it's like my, my body is telling me, my, my psyche is telling me there's something that needs to come out and be dealt with. She said, what is it? I said, I don't know. But when I do know, well, this went on for quite some time. And then one day we were watching this movie, and I, I can't remember the movie, but man, within that movie was just one line. And that one line set me free. And it was, I was able to forgive the people that allowed all that trauma. And from that point forward, something changed on the inside of me. I went from hate to love to understanding. So when we look at our Mm, my goodness. When we look at our psyche, psyche or our, our will and our emotions, Jesus already took care of all that. Now, let me say this. If you're on medication for antidepressants, things like that, you see a psychiatrist, continue to believe God until the place where you don't need them anymore, but don't just come off of them. They're there for a reason. They're keeping you stable so the people around you can deal with you. So, let's begin wrapping this up. Let's, let's look at this verse and kind of fill in the blanks again in Isaiah chapter 53. It said, he was crushed for our sins, right? He was redeemed, so he redeemed us from sin, which is our spirit. We could kind of say it this way. We were liberated from sin. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The punishment up for our peace, Jesus took. If you ain't got peace, that's your problem. Because he provided it. He took it for us. He took stress, anxiety, and worry. He took it. When Jesus was chastised for our peace, which is our soul, our mind, and emotions, and will... They were all redeemed. They were all renewed and placed back in a place of newness. Jesus liberated our soul. We could say it this way. Jesus delivered our mind, emotions, and will. He delivered our psyche. 
So not only did Jesus cover the physical arena, but the emotional arena and the mind as well. That's why it's important that you keep your mind covered in the Word of God. That's why it says, think on these things. Things are good. Things are lovely. Things have a good report. Our mind has a tendency to go to the worst of everything. And as long as you're thinking on that, you're not thinking on God's best. You're not thinking on the Word. Replace those thoughts with the Word of God. When thoughts come that I'll never be healed, say, no, that's not true. I have already am healed by the stripes of Jesus. When thoughts come, is this sickness is ever going to end? Yes, I'm already healed. My body's just coming in line with the Word of God. If that same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives and dwells on my inside, He will also quicken and make alive my mortal body. Plead the blood of Jesus over. Man, I plead the blood of Jesus in me, within me, over me, around me. The Bible says no sickness or disease or any plague come, come nigh my dwelling place. Why are these coming in? Because we are not putting action to our faith. We're not declaring with our mouth. Faith is moved through the earth, through our mouth and with our actions. And then by his stripes, we are healed. Jesus healed us by the, by the stripes that he took for us. This means that the whippings he took was for us. And this is where really Jesus liberated us from sickness and disease physically. So we've been set free from sickness by what Jesus did for us. With his stripes, we are healed. So let me ask you tonight, can there be any doubt that Jesus' work on the cross provided complete redemption for our spirit, soul, and body? I don't think so. Jesus provided the complete package. As we look at one last scripture, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, when Adam's sin and sin entered the world, Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. When Jesus came in the world, he forgave us of all our sin and stopped death in his tracks. He died so we could be alive. Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus said in John 10, 10, again, Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I have come to give them life. What kind of life does God have? Number one, he has eternal life. Number two, he has a life without sickness, disease, or pain. I don't think God gets up in the morning and says, man, I need a Tylenol because my back's killing me. Do you? I don't think there's any pain or suffering in heaven. So that's what Jesus came and provided for us, the availability to walk above and not beneath, to be the head and not the tail. In our next lesson, we're going to see how the cross, at the cross, Jesus destroyed sin and sickness. We're going to continue looking at this, and this concludes this lesson uh, on Back to the Basics on healing and how Jesus is our liberator. I'm Pastor Michael Pillmore. Thanks for watching.